join in freedom and worship in the way that we choose to worship in this chapel and other chapels throughout our land. And that is because we have had sacrifice of many people who have stood and for what they believe and helped us to have our freedom. Amen. Amen. We're going to have two minutes of silence, please, to re just to remember those people who have given their life as this is a Memorial Day service or a Day Remembrance Day service. Thank you. God bless. Everybody be seated. Of the hero. 
death casualties battles and fears of their own there's a price to be paid if you go if you stay freedom's fought for and won in numerous ways take two minutes what your mind it's a pittance of time for the boys and the girls all over may we never forget our young become vets at the end of the line it's a pittance of time it takes courage to fight in your own war it takes courage to fight someone else's war. Our peacekeepers tell of their own living hell. They bring hope to foreign lands that hate mongers and kill. Take two minutes, what's your mind? It's a pittance of time for the boys and the girls who go Still gone, battle for us, and lay their lives on the line. It's a pittance of time. In peace may they rest, lest we forget why they died. Take a pittance of time. Welcome everybody, and uh, this has been Good a tribute numbers. that we give every day. Welcome to the walk on this 11th day of November. Welcome to the start again. How should we start again? Sure should start again? You're not going to give up on this. Pull it out. Yeah. Just put it jack there. Push it jack and take it off. Okay. <laughs> we, do, we do that at Christmas time. We had to fall all along about six times <laughs> before we got it under control. Um, this is the one time a year that we do uh, dedicate for our people that have fought for our uh, freedom here. And so we are going to continue on with this portion of our service by playing Eternal Father played by Celia. You have the words here if you'd like to stand and sing them with us. And as you're singing them, there are poppies if you don't have one. We are going to place a poppy uh, just on the stage for our own thought of those people that we want to honor.
you. Everybody be seated. <coughs> I'd like to bring, everybody would like to bring a poppy. If you don't have one, one of the girls will pick up the basket there and give you a poppy to place oh. on the wreath or on the ground beside the roof. And as we do this, we think of all of those who have given the ultimate sacrifice that we may be free to worship in this chapel today. Kathy Smith is going to come up and give us a reading on Flanders Wheel. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. This has been an educational Remembrance Day for me because I really didn't know the history of the poppy until last night. <laughs> My parents said hi, poppy, so I'm long on the Everyone Mother's Day. And, and, uh, but last night I learned... Uh, the history of it, and it's a, I'm going to read you the history, and then I will read you the poem. The poem is called In Flanders Field. It is a war poem during the fir First World War by Canadian physician Lieutenant Colonel John McRae. On May 2nd, 9th, 1915, John McRae's close friend and former student, Alexis Helmer, was killed by a German shell. That evening, for security reasons, Helmer's burial in the cemetery was performed in complete darkness. The very next day, John McRae wrote the poem in Flanders Field. According to the legend, John McRae was writing this poem while Sergeant Marjorie Searle Allison was delivering mail to soldiers. Searle saw McRae sitting at the back of the ambulance parked just a few hundred yards north of Ypres, Belgium. Searle silently watched John and later recalled. John's face was very tired but calm as he wrote. He looked around from time to time, his eyes straying from Alexis Palmer's grave. Within moments, John had completed in Flanders Field poem. Initially, he was unsatisfied with his work. Without a word, John McRae walked over to Cyril, took his mail, and discarded the poem by handing it the poem to Cyril. Searle was deeply moved by the words of the poem. Searle said, in Flander Fields is an exact description of the scene in front of them. He said, John used the words blow in the line because the poppies actually were being blown that morning by a gentle wind. In Flanders Fields was first published December 8th of that same year. The poem is one of the most popular and most quoted poems of the war. Red poppies that grew over the graves of fallen soldiers resulted in the red remembrance poppy and the poem being one of the most recognized prominent memorial symbols for soldiers who have died in conflict. And this is how the poem reads. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place and in the sky, the larks still bravely sing and fly, scarce heard amid the guns below, we are the dead short days ago, we lived, felt, dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders Field. Pick up our quarrel with the foe. To you from falling hands, failing hands, we throw. The torch be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep through poppies 
in Flanders Fields. Grow. And that is what uh, John McCray wrote. In, uh, that's very, he was a poet, he wrote lots of poems, and uh, but this is the one that made a difference in, in uh, no, the five little copies today. Okay. Thank you. Can, we've got, can everybody hear the sound there? Okay. Just thought, thought maybe Kathy weren't holding it up by a number or something. You're a little quieter. <laughs> You're the quieter than I am. <laughs> I've got this up for you. Okay. Um, just like to talk a little bit about the influence and the heartbreak that goes on when these young men have, and women have to go to war. Kathy, you have a brother that served recently. Where was he serving? Um, he served quite a few places because he was a fireman. Yeah. And we have lots of young people that are serving now, and uh, there's a lot of families that are still suffering from the war that's going on, uh, women that receive letters saying their sons have died, women that receive letters that their husbands have died, families that have received letters that their, the mother of the family has passed away or has been killed in the war. And that's not only that, it's the, what happens to the bodies, the main body state, loss of limbs, the loss of their innocence because of what they need to do when they go there. They're forever changed. One of the things I'd like to talk about is in the dependence of time. Um, that video is just so moving. And it, you'll see in one part of it a young boy running to catch his father's hand as he's marching. And that is the little boy that lived in New Westminster as they were bringing the troops down 8th Street to be taken aboard the, the uh, trains and to take it into where the ships to be taken over uh, to, uh, to fight in the war. And the young boy is reaching his hand out and apparently that is going to be a picture that's going to become a tradition um, honoring the people there. But it really puts me in mind of what the war was for me. You look on the stage and you'll notice that there is a gentleman there. He's not in uniform because, unfortunately, my mother's had all the pictures and her stuff got flooded and all the pictures were ruined. So I only have a picture of my dad in later years. And the, I was fortunate enough that one of my aunts had the picture of me at the age I was when my father left. And I think often, of what it must have felt like because, you know, he would come home on, on weekends from camp. And so it really didn't impact me that what army he was in. He was in the army. That was his new job. He had been a chauffeur working for a, a very rich man. And he had gone into the armed forces because he felt that he wanted to do his duty. And because he was a little short guy, he even had to go to two or three different places to volunteer because he was too short, they said. But anyway, he went and he'd come home on the weekends and then he would be going back to camp and I would walk along with him and my last memory before he went overseas is walking along to the corner with my cousin and I who were the, around the same age, we were around five. And he gave us a nickel each to go and get a double-decker ice cream cone. Anybody know what double-decker ice cream cones are? They were wide, they had cones like that, and then you got two in each scoop. I mean, I don't know how we digested that, but we were so small, the ice cream was almost bigger than we were. He said, okay, you girls, go down and get yourself some ice cream, and we turned down the hill. And I turned back to see my dad waving, like this. What I didn't know, that my dad would be gone for five years. What my dad did know is that he was going overseas and he did not know if that might be the last time that he seen this baby girl.
that is some of the casualties that they had to suffer. Some of them came back, as my dad did, and we were fortunate. My father came back. But the other casualty of war that happened there is family split. Women were young. Men were young. Men went overseas. Some of them found other ladies. That they were there for five years. They knew, they knew if they were coming back the next day. The women were here, they were 22, 23, 28, 32, prime of life, not knowing if these men were ever going to return home. And there were men here that attracted them. That was another casualty of the war. The men came back and the marriage was not there. It so happened that that was the case in my father's case came home all excited, thinking that he had a wife and a child that he was coming home to. And nobody had told him, because what if he told him and he went out and got himself killed? Would not be terrible. That was their thinking. So he came home with the dream that within three weeks was totally shattered. So these are the things that are normal in everyday life. It's reality in everyday life. But those are even magnified, even greater, in a situation where the people have gone and done what they had to do and come back. And some of those men came back, not the same men as they went. And the families couldn't live with them. So there is a great sacrifice that is made. And to every race, creed of people, everybody served. Derek is going to come up and he's going to represent our First Nations that served. They were very strong in all of the wars and they are now still serving. And so Derek is going to come up and give us a tribute to those people of the First Nations and the Maiti people that did serve. So Derek, would you like to come? <coughs> They actually carry Eagle Staff that represents the fallen brothers and sisters that have fallen in wars. So there's always a veteran that will carry an Eagle Staff in the Grand Entry. And then they'll carry the flags from different peacekeeping flags from Canada, the United States, including this flag itself. When I bring these flags in, at first when I used to bring the flags in to help them, I really didn't understand why. I thought, okay, you carry a flag, you carry a flag, you're proud of, you know, representing your country. Until I realized that, you think about it back in time, people defended a country, and that's why a flag was developed. Because they were proud of who they represented, and battles. And for generations upon generations upon generations, there's always some sort of flag that was used First of all, they start off with a cenotaph with an eagle, golden eagle on top. And they go into wars. Then they change it to carrying these pyramidal type of pointed flags, and they felt that was important to them. Then they would carry banners, standing banners upright, and they would carry them, and two or three people go into battle. They're holding those flags. That's all they do. And if they got stabbed, killed, shot, speared, they lost their lives. Some guys came in, they were drummers, and they would drum into battles during the Civil Wars. Those drummers still gave their lives because they felt that they, as long as they played the drum, that those men will still continue on fighting. There's always someone that they always believed in that was a great leader, no matter who they fought for or with. My father. Uh, when he passed away, 
I didn't know he was in the military. He ever was in the military. When he passed away, I found a letter written to my mom uh, wanting to know how I'm doing. Apparently, I was only one year old. And he, and he was actually stationed at Camp Shiloh in, in Brandon, Manitoba, outside Brandon. And I didn't realize how cool it was because uh, when I was a kid, I was a Navy cadet. I wanted to go into the military. I wanted to try it out, see what it was like. Because when you're, when you're a young guy and you want to find out about respect and discipline, because a lot of us kids, when we were young, we didn't care about things. We just, you know, my father felt, you know, son, you should learn about a responsibility. You should learn to take on something that teaches you respect and honoring who you are and others. So when I became a Navy cadet, I was really happy about that. Then I wanted to become a sea cadet, but we ended up moving. And then the areas that I moved to, there was no no one taking anyone or even developing any type of organization. But I left it as it was. I almost joined the military. I came that close to joining. My father said, I need you on the farm. So I didn't go. And it's kind of interesting because some of us actually, oh, some, all, some of us actually talk about past lives. And when I start getting into the past life work and into this work as a medium and psychic phenomena, I did a past life regression with someone. And I saw myself as a Second World War British soldier. 23 years old, my first, I knew who my first name was, and here I am in the Second World War fighting the Germans. I'm, I'm infantry. I had a long rifle laying on the ground. The Germans are shooting upwards, hiding behind the wagons, the hay wagons, and they're shooting up at me, and I felt this pierce go whoop in my chest. And then I saw myself lifting into the clouds. They look like clouds, and then I'm gone. I hear people yelling at me, calling my name for that, maybe that first 30 seconds or so. That's it. That's all I felt. I didn't feel remorse, I didn't feel anything, just I was gone. And I thought to myself, we fight for something which is right. What we feel is right, it comes in our heart. We feel that we need to stand up for what is right, for our country and who we represent. And the First Nations people, they were called the wind talkers. And the wind talkers, why they call wind talkers? Because they spoke either Cree or Navajo. And they would use, or you call them co talkers, whichever we call ourselves wind talkers. But they were the men that used their language to send secrets from the US into other countries. And at the time, they actually had wind talkers fighting the Japanese, and the Japanese were trying to, they couldn't figure out the language. They had no way to understand what the language is. They couldn't decode it, because most people will decode backwards languages, you know, words, letters, you name it. Japanese would probably have solved it. But when they spoke a different language from another territory, they had no idea. They couldn't figure out what the Cree language was. They couldn't figure, because the phonetics are 80 letters the alphabet compared to what we have as a, as American alphabet, you know, very few. So they couldn't figure us out. But also, the First Nations men and the women were sent out to fight. And they, they always put the men out front because they were the best snipers and the best uh, at anything, really, as tracking people, guides. They knew there was a story about a young lady who I met. Her uncle's very famous. I won't mention his name. But her uncle could actually stand right behind you in a little ball. And you're standing out front as a German soldier and you wouldn't even know that he was there. That's how quiet and how close he could have gotten to a soldier. They were so quick. Night crush done. That's how quick it was. A lot of the First Nations men taught the American soldiers and the Canadian soldiers how to fight, not martial arts, how to defend yourself first. 
See, there is a lot of influence that we learned about defending ourselves. But the, we were never known, our people were never known as warriors to go and kill someone. Our people were sent out to defend for what was right. Our country needs defense. We need to be proud of who we are. My uncle was a helicopter pilot stationed in Port of Prairie. And he was in the military for a lot of years and retired. So back in 2005 in the Legion, I was very fortunate the very first time. I carried this flag, our Métis flag, and the color, with the color guard. I'm the very first man that represented the Métis nations able to walk side by side with the color guard. We walked three square blocks representing the Métis. It was never done before and never done since. And the reason why they allowed it to happen that time is because they thought it might work to get more of our Métis veterans to come forward and accept their being to be honored. Because a lot of our, our soldiers now today feel, some of them feel disgrace because of certain wars they fought, whether it's in Vietnam or other parts of the world. They felt disgraced. They felt that they did something wrong. Guys are stationed in, in Afghanistan. I got a good friend of mine. He was, he was actually a paranormal investigator. A British, he was actually a veteran for four, uh, 12 years. And he fought with the, with the British. And, you know, these men, they suffered with post-traumatic post disorder. <coughs> so if you see someone out there that carries a copy, or you see someone out there as a veteran, you walk up to him and you say to him, thank you for defending the people. It's important that we do this. And the young ones need to understand that. Because it's not something that's, you know, well, I wish I was a soldier, I wish I could kill people. That's not what it's about. You don't go up kill someone, you're there to defend for what is right. Because we're known, to, our country is known as a peacekeeping country, and that's important to us. This is what we have left. There's a song that we sang to honor all of our Aboriginal people and everyone. And I want to share this song with you guys. The song of pride of who we are. Doesn't represent that doesn't represent just me. It represents everyone.
almost done. We do lots of clapping in the church, but today is a very solemn time, so we are not doing that. I'd like to honor some other people. We do have some people that attend our church, and uh, they came from other countries that were our enemies at one time. And so we have to honor the fact that people get into wars, and they do have to go for the country, country that they are in and stand and fight. And so very many of our, what we call enemies, are now our friends. And uh, we'd like to honor their people that did sacrifice their lives for what they believe to be right at that time. And we remember that our motto in this chapel is that all spiritual pathways lead to the same God. And so everybody has a right to their belief system. And uh, now it seems as if we are friends and good neighbors with many of the people who were involved in the wars throughout the times. And we will hope that the people that are involved with wars now will become friends and peace will be seen in those countries as well. So God bless the spirit of all people who have lost their lives to try to defend the rights of their homeland. Okay, now this will end the uh, service of, of the Memorial Park for all our uh, veterans. So this will be our remembrance. Uh, we'll go on tomorrow. A lot of you will go to the Cenotaph. There's some things going on today, which may also be part of the reason that people aren't coming out to the chapel, and it's a holiday weekend. But we are glad for those people that did come and celebrate with us. And we are going to go on to the normal, everyday, workaday world that we're in. And uh, we will ask Celia if she will come and join us in the hymn. It is no secret, not that you have there, number 45. I, my typing was not the best. So That's going to be cool. set that down now. So That's okay. There you go.
Okay, everybody can be seated. We are going to uh, ask that anybody that would like healing facilitation can sit in the circle at the back. We are going to put on the meditation for healing. And uh, if you do not need assistance, then you may sit in your chair and just enjoy beautiful meditation. And uh, just relax or hold it back and the healing facilitators will join you. around you, of your teachers and 
with your leaders and allow that energy to ripple out and touch all of them so that they too may experience the wonderful healing the wonderful peace allow that energy now to go forward into the world and not only touch the world's leaders but to touch the animals, the vegetation, the waters, the atmosphere so that they may be healed. And let us be thankful to the animals and the vegetation and the minerals that give of themselves and serve us so greatly and feed us so well. us now to reach out into the universe, into other parts of the universe that we are not familiar with, for many mansions in God's world that we are not aware of every room in every mansion. But we send love and we send caring, for God promises us that love and healing is never ending. And all we need to do is ask. And the energy will follow the intention of the thought. And the healing will begin. Now as we circle back to the seat of the soul, take a few moments just to sit quietly before you come back to your everyday workaday world to enjoy the tranquility and the peace of the healing area of your garden, the inner garden of healing. And know that you may visit here at any time and God has promised the love and the healing is never ending. So open your hearts, your mind, and your hand. God bless you, and He sends His angels to keep after you. We'd like to thank the facilitators from both sides, the spirit side and from the side here that helped bring that energy from the source to help you heal yourself and to heal the community at large. And we have a bowl that is uh, sitting on the table there that anybody would like to put absent healing in. The healing facilitators do do prayers on that bowl every day. It is also connected with bowls from all over the world. Uh, and there's some people here that are visiting us from First Church and you know about the fellow that used to come up and talked about the bull there that is from uh, Arkansas, he's now passed away and has started all of us having these bowls that connect throughout the world so that is really helping with the healing facilitating for the people that we do absent healing for 
Okay, some uh, interesting things now. We're going to go into the commercials. And uh, the commercial first starts <coughs> off with interesting. Anybody have birthdays or anniversaries? <coughs> oh, wow. I got a birthday today. My granddaughter, one of my granddaughter's birthday is today. <coughs> and her grandson is, my first son is coming up soon. going on until we get into the Christmas time and we will be um, having a, a candlelight service and a potluck dinner to follow it. Now I have to clarify, there is a rumor going around that we're closing. We are not closing, we are relocating and we have put it on Facebook yesterday but I guess I'm going to have to take an ad out in the newspaper. So. The other thing is the good news travels fast, right? So everybody here that thinks it's good news, pass on that we are actually going to have our meetings at 2.30 in the afternoon, starting in the 5th of January at the Calmar restaurant. It's going to give us a chance that if anybody wants to go for brunch ahead of time, we can kind of get an extra little visit in. We can go in and we'll have some muffins and tea there, coffee for everybody. And we will have speakers that will be coming in. The format will be slightly different than what we have now. But we will have speakers coming in. And there is a possibility that they have Wi-Fi there. We might even be able to bring in some of the speakers from England uh, by Skype. The only thing is we need to put out a help, help, help manifestation like we did for this church when we needed to furnish it. We need people who know something about computers and know about Skype and know about talking on all these, what do they call, chat rooms and stuff. Because I can't, even if they teach me how to do that, I can't be doing that and doing this at the same time. So uh, we do need some help because we'd like to start having some of our people that are online come in and chat with us and maybe people that are from out out of the city, which see our tapes every week, they'll be able to call in and see what's going on and join us. So we're hoping that that'll be a new venue for us and a, a kind of a new direction for the chapel to go. And we will continue to serve as we have in the past. Uh, we do find that this is going to give us a little bit more money to do community work. Uh, it will give us a little bit more money to help those people that are in our own church that do not have the financial um, good fortune that the rest of us have, sometimes they need a little hand up, a little foot, you know, hold to get a step up so 